You are listening to a discussion born in the Christian ghetto. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in the Christian ghetto today. Um, today's my privilege to bring you C.J. Engel and Ronald Dodson, and we're going to be talking through today um, this idea that it's important for Christians to be political. There are many in the Christian community who resist this idea for various reasons. Um, you know, they, they're afraid. Many are afraid of this idea of imposing the faith on people. Others say that the role of the Christian is to spread the gospel, not to rule society. Um, there are they're just a series of concerns that many Christians have. And um, I was recently listening to, to CJ on another podcast, the, the Jay Burden Show, and he was walking through um, this necessity for it. And I thought, hey, let's get together and expand on this a little bit. And then for those of my listeners too, these are not interviews, these are conversations. So if I talk more than your normal host, um, that's fine because we're having a dialogue, not doing an interview. But and as I thought I would give you perhaps a chance to start, CJ, and to maybe outline your thoughts of why it's important for Christians to be engaged um, politically and in you know what we call the political. Yeah, so Ron and I might have a little bit of disagreement on this, um, just the overall framing, uh, which, oh, that's is, fine. which is interesting. So I think that's good, though. We might have an interesting back and forth. But, um, you know, my whole thing is I is I do emphasize the two kingdoms. And, I, and a lot of people have been talking about this, um, this framework and, you know, why do you always have to bring it up? But for me, it's fundamental because it helps me. Um, it helps set up my own response to what, you know, what you might call Christian pietism. Uh, and I'm going to explain what that is, but Christian, okay, Pietism, I was say that. yeah, in other in other people whose whose rhetoric really pushes back against um, political involvement um, of Christians. And so, when I say two kingdoms, what I mean is that we do, you know, as Martin Luther pointed out, we are we are just and sinners at the same time, and we belong in in some ways to two different worlds. We belong to the kingdom of Christ, and we have a heavenly destination. And that covenant with Christ is mediated directly by Christ. It's it's invisible. Uh, it's it's or, you know as or Richard Hooker says, it's mystical. It's something that's um, in our souls and in our consciences. So when we talk about Christian politics, we are not talking about the 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 um, we're not asking the state to involve itself in our consciences to you know to force conversions, gun to the head, accept Christ. Um, things like that, those are all carved off and siloed out. <clears throat> when we're talking about um, Christian politics, we're talking specifically about, um, you know, what I call, you know, natural relations or creation institutions, things that bind us to each other as human beings, not as, you know, post-grace uh, participants in, you know, the, the kingdom of Christ. So there's these two kingdoms that we're a part of. One has to do with our spiritual relations. One has to do with our uh, natural relations. Our natural relations are things like our family, our people, our our country, our our, our nation. Things that define us, um, you know, beyond or in in a greater, uh, more broad capacity than the spiritual kingdom of Christ. And so people will say things like, you know, Christians should only focus on spreading the gospel. You know, Christians, you can't have forced conversions. It's a, it's inappropriate to use the state um, to spread the kingdom of Christ. Well, there's two things going on here. I belong to the kingdom of Christ in one sense. But I also belong to this very civil kingdom in another sense. And my entire family is not saved, but I do have natural duties and natural obligations to them. We, we do constitute um, an actual people, a political society. You can take these families and put them together. We do have a shared experience, a shared history. And those things um, are important to us because God you know, gave us a place to live. He gave us a family that we should associate with, and he gave us a, a you know, a, a more broad scale, a people that we should work together and discover um, the good life together. You know, we should defend our heritage. We should defend our values and we should, uh, you know, we should pursue that. Th those are different pursuits. Those are good sanctioned created um, relations that are distinct from our spiritual relations. Um, so in that sense, you know, I have these Christian relations with people all around the world. You know, I'm united to them in Christ. 
um, but I'm not united to them in a political sense. You know, they are not part of my civil kingdom. They are the other. They are they are outside of the political order. So these I, I'm involved in these two different worlds. And as a Christian, I belong. I have I have different types of obligations to each of these families. And so when I talk about, you know, Christian involvement in politics, I'm talking about specifically the obligations as a created being to those in the civil kingdom. That's a that's a really interesting that that last bit, the way that you put it is very, very interesting, CJ, the the. This idea that that we have. A you know, in a sense, like a global community of Christ, that we are together as a community under Christ. But then there is this idea that more locally, I form a different set of bonds with the people that surround me geographically or for other bonded reasons, and that these two are not the same thing. And and that they have different, you know, exigencies and to place different demands upon us. And those demands from the local people are in that sense, political. And, you know, part of that reality is, is the, this, the, the sinful world that we live in, in that sense where you could, in theory, have two Christian communities geographically separated who come into conflict with each other. Well, that's exactly right. This is Martin Luther talked about this when he was talking about the, um, you know, the invasion of the Turks in his context. So he was dealing with the idea that why should he as a German Christian, take up arms against Christians who were fighting for the sake of another political order? Is that even appropriate? Because should Christians be fighting each other? And he answered that yes, but they're not fighting each other in capacity as their united Christian uh, nature or Christian um, you know, destination. They're fighting each other because of their own um, civil disparities. They're fighting each other because they belong to separate political orders that are in conflict. So it's not that Christians are fighting against Christians in the spiritual war, but it's a very political thing. Um, it's it secularizes the kingdom, um, but not in the way that moderns talk about secularization. The, the classical view of secularization was it had a broad understanding of the kingdom. It was outside just specifically the, the elect, you know, the the people that were predestined to become, uh, you know, saved. Those are united in a certain sense, but there's also bind you know bounds that we, binds that we have with other people outside of that those are our created relations and so martin luther dealt with that he said yes christians can fight um other christians but it's not the sp it's not a clash of spiritual kingdoms that's a clash of civil kingdoms and so yes we can we can have conflict with other christians even though we know these these are political fights that have to be dealt with because we still have duties and obligations to those natural relations. We still have duties to our heritage, our ancestors, and our posterity. But um, those things should not be confused with the fact that when all this temporal order is over, we will be united with each other in Christ. Well, yeah. Okay, so the, the, this this is this is like a really good see because I I come at it you I, I come at it in this sense from from a Dutch neo Calvinist perspective. So I went and just kind of skimmed over again um, Kuiper's Stone lectures and and the mm -hmm. the lecture on on politics again too. And within the Dutch Reformed tradition, there's a there's a much greater tendency to look at it within a as a unity in a sense of the kingship of Christ over all things. So there, there is this overlying overarching unity of, of Christ as King over all facets, all realms of life. Mm -hmm. So that's that your grand unifying feature. But within this, there's these various aspects and Kuiper makes the case. He says, if it were not for human sinfulness, the political would not exist. And so right. there so is this, this sense of that, because you wouldn't be brought into conflict with each other. Families would naturally form, they would cooperate, you know. So the, so this this idea of the, or the necessity of the political and, and conflict over resources, conflicts over, all of this arises because of, of human sinfulness. And so there is almost a sense where the political is a form of God's common grace to, Restrain, restrain within a series of institutions the, I mean, for lack of better terms, the violence inherent in the state. Mm 
So on the one hand, you have the what people fear is that this, there's this corrupting element in the use of, of power. So that's there, that the, the use of power is going to impose itself and um, rob you of your inherent freedom as a human being, the, the way that God created you. Um, but at the same time, the, the there's this threat to the state. There is also this good that comes from the state in that the state becomes an instrument of restraint of evil within a political body by means of the use of force. So you have these two balances where the state is on one hand grace because what it does is it restrains violence within a form of officialdom, while at the same time it also represents a threat to humans. So you you balance the, these two things, both its threat and its grace within this institution, and then um, you understand that this is all underneath the kingship of Christ, um, that then politics, despite its dangers, becomes a vocation for the Christian, like a, a called upon vocation. And this goes back to, you know, the Old Testament kings and so forth, God instituting. So God places persons within a sinful world to administer this kind of justice, social order, but also to protect the people from its enemies that arises because of the the because of the human sinfulness and that's mm -hmm. really what you're what you're trying to deal with here is that there's a materiality to human sinfulness that has to be grappled with and um the magistrate in that sense is god's gift to us in grace um despite all of its complexities to grapple with the the realities of a sinful world in a practical manner if that makes sense yeah so i think from my perspective um I, I would agree that this is an is an added layer onto the function of the magistrate within a post lapsarian. That means after the fall, after a, you know after mankind fell, this is something that's added onto the nature of politics. However, I you know there's this debate in Christian historical theology, political theology about you know the source of the state, the source of the magistrate. One view takes up um, takes up the case that. The state is something that's added to human life uh, after the fall. And the other view is that it's actually organic and precedes the fall. Um, so Kuiper, as you said, and Martin Luther agrees with this, believe that the state is something that was created uh, after the fall because of man's sinfulness. Um, there are other continental reformers, and, and Stephen Wolf has this position. Um, this would be more like the, um, you know, Catholics can take up this view the anglican political theology takes up this view um you know, like turretin others take up this view that the state actually precedes the fall because um there are scarce resources we are human beings living living in a world of scarce resources we have um, unlimited desires but we have to coordinate these desires within um just the context of physical temporality and so the state is actually has a function before the fall it's just that all the things that you said are added on to it after the fall dealing with evil man becomes much more complicated and there's another additional layer another additional series of obligations that the state has to deal with um because of the fall so um, these are two different these are two slightly different views and on that i'm slightly different than kuiper um, obviously I still believe that God is God of all, but he has a, a slightly different model than I do. In fact, his model might even be more similar to, to Ron's and maybe, maybe we could let him it talk. Could be, <laughs> well, I was just going to say, just to clarify. So in a sense, what you're saying is that this notion of a material social order precedes the fall that just because just be, Prior to the fall into sin, there would be a social order within a society that would be administered by human beings. It just would not be administered without the complications of having to do so in a sinful world, if exactly. I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah, so okay. there's two things that the sin adds. The one, it adds the, the, the need to restrain man's passions. Um, I could passion. probably agree with that. That's, Jay, that's the first thing. Yeah. But the second thing it does is it absorbs the conflict between peoples. This is, pe people have a really hard time with this. When we talk about the political, people always jump to what laws should we have? What's the proper laws? Where should we look to for the laws that restrain people? That's important, but that's actually not the, the, um, the foundation of the political. The foundation of the political is the fact that some sort of order needs to be established so that we can talk about what laws should be applied. Something has to be laid down as a groundwork to absorb 
um, competing visions for, you know, competing claimants to the authority to exercise law, to create law, all those things. So the order itself is something that's added on to after the sin because people want to conquer other people. There are enemies out there that want to um, control the jurisdiction that you're in. This is something that's also added. This is the foundation of the political. The rest of it's just like the legal. The legal stands on top of the political. So that's important to bring up too. We can talk about that later on, but those are two things that sin adds to the equation. And it's maybe just give you a chance, Ron, to jump in. Well, I think it's, uh, I, I, first of all, I think it's profoundly fascinating uh, the uh, what precedes what, and I apologize, we've, uh, I'm in my office and there's some conversations going on. Uh, but for me, I think it's, I, I think both of you guys come from a more uh, scholastic tradition th than I do, even though I have a great appreciation for those guys, I think my view would just be a little simpler uh, in, in that I would push the kingdom is mystical. Absolutely. It is spiritual, but that in the modern sense has been used as an opposition to the real. And uh, that's my chief concern that I think the preamble to the Great Commission established direct authority. And dominion with Christ now, uh, you know, from uh, at the resurrection or the ascension, depending on how you view that. Uh, and, and that was a real dominion and authority. Now, the question is, what role does the church and Christians play in that, uh, which is a fun debate to have? You know, I see the the kingdom with as a as a colonizing force among the states the states not the united states but the states of the of the world so the goal isn't in in especially in evangelicalism this turns into the spiritual view ends up being reduced obviously this is not what you guys are arguing but this is what it commonly is reduced to the idea that we are looking to populate heaven Whereas I think the biblical view is, no, we're looking to colonize earth. And there is this distinct and strange uh, and unnatural but necessary uh, uh, intermediate state where we're a spirit and body uh, uh, apart. But the, but the, the destination uh, in the consummation is, is here on earth. And we are bringing again. This is some of my post-millennialism coming out. A little bit of uh, a little bit, but not too much Vantillian uh, thought. But um, really, I, I appreciate uh, a lecture that uh, N.T. Wright gave way back in '98, '99 uh, about uh, uh, in in speaking on the Book of Philippians. And the idea, this colonization idea that Paul turns on his head, that, that Caesar, uh, that, that Rome was crowded and dirty, and we needed to get the people out into the lands to take Rome there. Not The purpose of colonization was not to bring more people, citizens back to Rome. And that Paul turns that around and says, that's the, that's the purpose of the kingdom. So... When it comes to uh, how we as Christians now participate in the state, I think it has to, uh, the purpose is in furthering that project. And that is largely given to prudence. Um, I have found little to disagree with either anything either one of you guys have said. I just don't ever want the the kingdom's spirituality to be opposed to its materiality mm -hmm. and uh uh and then i think part of this the 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 as we are in this uh post-continental post kuiper and now post you know we had in the in the 80s uh and and Kryptos and I are old enough to remember this in the late eighties and early nineties, the kind of theonomic reconstruction movement, uh, which said, 
you know, was kind of making the argument that Torah was a civil code. And then guys oh, yeah. came along after who had an appreciation for, for, you know, and that's Rush Dooney and North and, and Bonson. And, yeah. those guys. and then, but I think quite rightly, a lot of the, uh, the more thoughtful guys, there was a whole uh, cohort who just rejected that uh, 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 without interacting with it. But I really appreciated the guys who interacted with it because they said, well, it can't be a civil code because it doesn't deal with the very things that CJ brought up. It doesn't deal with water rights. It doesn't deal with these particularized ways of life that come into conflict. And what are ways of life in the, in the, in the sense of the kingdom is how do we, as Schmidt say, how do we individually as different people groups fight off antichrist? And, uh, you know, as a, 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 how do we fight off unholiness? And those are particularized ways. And so the state is this sponge that soaks up the natural conflicts that come about. Uh, we are ultimately, we reject in one sense, the multiculturalized idea that all cultures are equal and, and valid, but we recognize the multicultural uh, 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 reality that there are particularized means of pursuing godliness, pursuing uh, uh, a culture that reflects God's will. And that has to do with cultural maturity, different abilities, so on and so forth. So I, 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 I think that um, for me, and then the one last thing I was going to say is I think sometimes the, the debate over uh, the law as meritorious, in other words, the covenant of works and how that plays with, with the old covenant law and how that interacted with the state of Israel and does that apply here and was it meritorious? I, I think sometimes that gets into this. And, you know, Calvin rejected the idea of, of merit and the, the later scholastics had a more positive view of a, a meritorious view. And I think that at times works its way into this argument in the presuppositional aspect. And I'm going to stop talking there. I want all my to. The, the, for, I was thinking as, as one of, one of the things that might be helpful then, and I've, I've often said, you know, in terms of like the necessity of the political, even when we get back to like, you know, God's provision for the political, you know, is it, you know, um, social organization pre and post fall and so forth. Um, to look at the this sense of uh, we talk about a, a oftentimes in in classical thinking of a partnership between church and and the state or church and the throne in the the proper management of a well ordered society. And I said I always try to bring people back to the beginning. So let's let's assume, for example, that you're correct that the role of the church, and I, I agree, this is to spread the gospel and make disciples, and to do not just to fill the pews, but to actually make disciples. You know, the preaching of the word, the administration of the sacraments, um, and 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 so forth. So let's assume as a as a group, you begin as a minority, and you're very very successful in this, and you begin to start making conversions and people are accepting Christ, and you're doing it non-coercively, you're spreading the gospel, and you're presenting it, and people are believing. And sooner or later, the all of a sudden, you go from being a small minority to perhaps a majority position in, in society. So now what is going to happen? You are the majority in society. And let's assume perhaps, you know, you've got now a democratic um uh, you know, a democratic foundation for society. So you vote and, uh, you know, so are are you then as a, a, a church people, even though you constitute the majority of society, are you then expected to absent yourself from the, the larger body politic in your nation and say, well, we can only be ruled by by heathens because it's unseemly for us as Christians to to take up the political. Even though, let's say, for example, we now make up 75% of the population, we have to allow ourselves to be run or to to be our society to be managed and ruled by that 25% because they're pagan and it's it's okay for pagans to to take up power because that's 
That's kind of what pagans do. But we as Christians are pure and we don't do that. The whole, I think, once you play the argument out, it becomes nonsensical. So then really, as if, if you bring it back then, is there really then anything that would prevent a small, engaged group of a Christian minority from stepping into the political as a calling to then manage society in a way which is harmonious with um, we might call the law of God or you know God's creation order, natural law, however you would define that, but to then, you know, to 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 take that thing from religious belief to morality to law, that sort of chain that that somebody like Carl Schmidt um, identifies, to sort of step into the political as a calling, even though you are an a, a minority of society, like in the US it'd be like what, 35%? Um, in Canada, it would be like 5%. But is it then a valid thing for us to, as Christians, to step into the political and say that it would be good for society if, even though we're a minority, for Christians to be making laws in the larger body politic? And our case and thing is that, yes, this would be a better thing than to have heathens making laws. And we're not necessarily trying to impose the faith on anybody. We're just saying that the laws which flow out of Christian teaching are, in our belief, inherently better than the laws which flow out of an atheist or a pagan perspective. And again, that's kind of the argument. That's how I've tried to lead people to this idea that um, you know there is a real validity, even if you're a gospel-oriented, gospel-first type of person, that there's a necessity for Christians to be involved in the political. Because eventually, sooner or later, if you're successful at spreading the gospel, you're going to have to deal with this sooner or later. So you might as well come up with a theory of how to do it well. I guess that's well, kind this, of the question that put. This just brings up the question of what is the gospel, though. Um, it, it, that again, it, it's been it's been in the modern sense, it, it's been opposed, placed in opposition to what to the real or material. Uh, you know, uh, is the gospel primarily? a formulation of salvation by faith alone, you know, pietistic, uh, is it? Yeah. A, con a conversionist sense. And this is where, this is where my kind of more objective covenantalism comes out, or is it primarily an announcement of a King who does save, he saves his, his, his subjects who are, have pledged allegiance to him, who have, who have exercised pistis. They are, they are, you know, and there's, and so that sounds to a lot of our, 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 you know, when I put my Puritan hat on, that sounds like a work almost. But when I just read the text, it, 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 it doesn't. Um, I don't know, CJ, I'd love to hear you on, on, uh, on, on talk about that because yeah. I think your introduction was fascinating. You know, one of the one of the things that I emphasize, we have this model, this like um, instinctual model that and it's based on liberal, liberal democracy, where the masses basically discover what they want to believe in and then it percolates up into power. Well, the entire history of Christendom is actually the opposite. What happened exactly. is the, the, the political leader, the elite, yes. he converted. Well, what happens if the elite converts? The masses believe things because they've been handed down them over generations, over centuries. Amen. Amen. I, I, okay, let's stop the podcast here. <laughs> so, the question historically is, what happens to society if the prince converts? That's the big question. Because when when King Alfred, when he you conquered march your, the Vikings, you march your people through the river. Oh, yes. Sorry. When so yeah, when when King Alfred, when he when he defeated the Vikings and he made. Um, when he made their king convert to Christianity, the Viking people were all baptized, not because they, you know, read the scriptures and believe, you know, had faith and belief, but because their king led them in that direction. So this is just federal headship. I exactly. And this Romans is the, four and five. And this is this is why I emphasize this is the way that God has ordered the the cosmos. There's a certain order to it. And so the question is not if we can spread the gospel to as many people as possible, should they be represented in power? The, you know, the, the, the question, the question is, you know, 
as Christians, should we see, you know, should we seek political power and should we pursue that chain of events, that downstream chain of events that over time, um, the society is Christianized, not in the sense that people are just, you know, doing everything individually, but because the political leader, the elite, he sets the pace, he sets the tone, he sets the framing of the way that culture is going to develop. Culture is downstream from power. In, in a sense, not with a gun to everybody's individual head, but because people, the reason people believe in transsexuality, the people, the reason people believe in homosexuality, the reason people hate Christianity is because they are mirrors. They reflect the priorities of the elite. That's what, that's what's going on here. So, so it's, it's never about getting ma majority people to agree with you. Um, and that's how you can, that's how you can Christianize society. You, I, I couldn't agree more. This yeah, is so, so good. Yeah, and it's it's Paul, right? Paul yeah, appealed the, the to Christianization Caesar. of society is downstream from act from from minorities. So it's all about mm -hmm. um, strengthening the vanguard. That's what it's about. It's all about the minority of people who eventually can capture power. And the point of capturing power is not to put to, the gun to people's head and make say convert. No. The point of capturing power is to prevent the materialists from capturing power. Because right. if the but materialists control... capture power, if the seculars capture power, the people are going to reflect their priorities. But if we capture power, they are no longer in the position of influence and society and mass culture will adjust accordingly. Yeah, we're just speaking of the of the who who owns the public square. Yes. Issue. And that's that's really where that's the brass tax that that uh, pe people are very concerned about the about the uh, coercion of the conscience. What what really the battle is, and especially in the in the United States South, in in the belt of evangelicalism, it's a huge with with the Southern Baptist. I was baptized Southern Baptist, so I can speak to this. That's a huge concern. We can't you know, we can't coerce the, the conscience. We can't put that in conflict. But the real the real conflict is the control. And I. I the the bounding of the public square not even the control it's the it's what is off what is what is trespassing what is the sin of trespass what is the crime of trespass in the public square and who gets to determine that and should christians over time have more and more say over that and i think is more and that is not coercive to the to the heart that is uh, that is just the pattern set forth in in Torah. Well, it's it's like it's like look at the masses. Look at the mass opinion in the 20th century. None of that has been coerced, but it has been. But it has been transformed. I mean, if these people, if all these people were born in you know the the 16th century, none of them would believe in trans. This isn't this organic like we've decided that um, you know the homosexuality is okay and um, you know transsexuality is okay. These are things that are downstream from the elite. You know, the, nobody was coerced into doing this, and yet it still comes from power. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I didn't agree what, more. <laughs> what do you think, Kryptos? Well, I was going to say, as I was listening to to CJ talk about this too, it 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 bumps into another one of these misconceptions that society is founded on the individual, right? And and the the notion of of individualism that each person is a is a is a, is a do, a distinct, unique political entity, um, you know, island unto himself, is a kind of anti-society. And so you have to recognize that um, you've been hoodwinked into the idea that society is individualistic and it's based upon the, your own exercise of personal choice. And the, I mean, that's, the, the that's that's straight from the Enlightenment. I mean, that's where that yeah, comes. that's Lockean uh, mm -hmm. tabula rasa. Yeah. Whereas the truth is that self is that society is built up around the family unit, right? It, you know, Kuiper, who still remained democratic at his heart, still came back to this idea that the, the society is built around family and communities, and in that, then there is the role of, you know, you talk about the father and then the gift of the father. And there is that that hierarchy within family, within society. You know, people make the thing, well, it's nobody's business what's in my bed, what I do in my bedroom. Well, yes, it does, because we as a people are not isolated monads. We are connected to each other um, 
in order to be a community, you're connected to each other at a level that is, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, is spiritual. So you have a spiritual connection with your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so there is this sense that like Paul talks about this in, in first Corinthians, you know, when one of you suffers, the, the body suffers, there is a sense where if one of us sins, the body sins. And so we recognize as a Christian, uh, as Christians, that it is a, it's an objectively good thing um, for us to do what we can to curb sin in society because this makes the whole of society better. Because when one of us sins in private in our bedroom, it affects the whole body of believers or the whole body, the whole community, the, the whole political community of, of the people. Um, and, and so this idea that then, you know, from, you know, we talk about like uh, Gerard mimetically, that a well-ordered elite that is upright and godly then through imitation, through desire, um, the the people, as you say, CJ, pick up on on that uprightness, that godliness, and then try to imitate it. And in a sinful world, of course, you're always going to have those who sure. who fall. I mean, we all fall down. So part of the role of the state then is to enforce the kinds of behaviors that build an upright society. Yeah, and it's also to recognize what things are political. I mean, you know, if it was if it was 1500s and say this, you know, this this guy came up with his hypothetical internet, right? Like 1500 and he started working on legislation that would ban, you know, this dissemination of pornography on the internet. Um, you know, what a complete waste of time. There's no political reason to do that. You know, see the point is not to create all these various laws that could hypothetically um protect the community from certain sins it's to address things that are politically relevant it's to address so calvin talks about this he says in some countries in some nations they struggle with certain things that are a threat to the political order um, that are different than another nation would the the political problems in france um in in 15 in the 1500s are not the um the, the political things that should be pursued in you know in india you know, at, at that side, assuming that India was Christian, you know, still. So, this you, is such a great insight. It's mean, so important for these people are the, to understand. This is the particularity that's relevant is, is the point is not to go around and saying, look, um, you know, here's 50, here's 50 commandments that I've drawn up from scripture about, you know, living, um, you know, righteous lives. And, and everyone needs to adhere to these. And if you don't, then you're going to be punished. The point is to recognize which things are a threat to the political order. The point of the political order is not to men, make men righteous, but to order society in a heavenward way, in, in, a, in a general sense, but also to protect, uh, protect the stability and the integrity of the realm in a political sense. You know, what what are certain habits? So like, you know, like if there to was subdue someone, chaos. Yeah, there, I mean, there, if if there was someone, you know, if if we, if homosexuality was not a thing, and we wouldn't need to put up cameras in everybody's bedroom to ensure that they're not doing X thing, we wouldn't we wouldn't need to do that. But the second it becomes a public thing and everyone starts talking about it, it, it undermines the political order, and then it's something we need to address, you know, politically. So, so, so statute, yeah, real quick. So statutes, we're not talking about the basic morality, the fundamental reality, the the right the 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 second half of the ten commandments past that statutes do not exist in the world of forms these are not eternal pre uh, uh precepts that we apply equally everywhere that 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 is uh uh they are to a particular place in time uh that that uh with wisdom and prudence we don't go cutting all the babies in half. That was an applied <laughs> bit of wisdom and prudence to that situation. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Well, summary it's wisdom of that tells you to know, like it's only wisdom that can tell you in a certain situation that the best thing to do. And that's really where like a lot of these things, we, we you know, they talk about the policy manual. Um, they can't be prescribed in advance. They, they, and that's really the, the, the scriptures are very cognizant of this idea that many decisions that you make are made in the moment. And the only way to know the right thing to do is to live rightly before the face of God. And then in the moment, you will know what the right thing to do is. And they're well, not you always... the legal miracle, basically, as, yeah. as Schmidt would say. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. 
Um, that's that's very that's very good. I I have argued, See, CJ. That, and, and we I, don't we don't disagree. <laughs> Well, no. No, but this, it, it's Not just, it's a big topic though, with a lot of stuff, yeah. a lot of moving pieces, right? Um, because you, you, know, you get the whole thing of like a, a society that is well discipled by the Christian community is also a, a society that, you know, is morally healthy, well ordered, and probably doesn't require a lot of state interventions to uphold it, that order. Yeah. This is another yeah. important thing too. Um, you know, it's, like everyone always quotes that, you know, the Benjamin Franklin line about a republic, if you can keep it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, John Adams talked about that. It was a system made for a moral people. Um, you know, what this means is that in a world of immoral people, in a world where we can't keep the republic, we have to take, we still have political things to do. And the, the type of, th you know, the type of political activity that many on the left would call, you know, tyr you know tyrannical or dictatorship or all those things, um, those are unfortunate but necessary components of a people who have lost their moral basis. So the ideal is not a situation where the state is at your doorstep making sure that you're, you know, doing good things. There's a certain state of emergency that comes to play when people have lost the ability to self-govern. You know, so this is this is another thing. Freedom is downstream from a moral people. If you don't have that moral yes. basis, then tyranny is the result. Otherwise, you get a complete anarchy. So you have to. So, so you know, the political becomes fiercer. It becomes nastier. The more corrupt people become, and the people well, are we see this throughout the world. They've been betrayed by the elites. They've been fed, you know, a stock of good about a stock of. And this is another thing. Why is it important for Christians to be in political leadership? Because they set the pace, they set the tone that the people eventually will be uh, will follow. And this this is what B Edmund Burke talked about over the centuries, as the uh, as as the political society. Um, was was harnessed as their passions were restrained. It allowed the state to become more liberal. Liberalism is not this universal ideal, but the state can become more liberal if the people can become more self-governed and the people are more restrained. So, when he talks about the softening of power in the late 18th century, he's talking about the benefits of a moral people. Once the people have lost that moral basis, the state can no longer be liberal. It's it's like this. The people want a liberal state and licentious community. You can't have both. If you want a liberal state, you have to have a morally restrained society. Yeah, well, and, and the softening of that power cannot give the people the tools to prevent the state uh, from reexerting its moral authority. And that's what we've seen happen: is that there's no check on this on this spiral. Uh, 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 frankly, of 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 degeneracy, there's there's no natural break on that because the tools have been removed uh, in which in which to do so. They've been given to those who just want to champion that furthering, uh, which just means the correction is going to be that much more exactly uh, Nasty. Uh, messy. Right. What were you going to well, say? And, and, well, people. Also, too, I think, and this is because they misunderstand the notion of of community. They are just think of sort of people getting together and just kind of being all kumbaya together. But in a in a really good book, um, Alan Ehrenholtz um, went through and 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 really did a deep dive by interviewing people who were alive when real communities were functioning and tried to identify the characteristics that made up a real community. Right, because we talk about the 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 community as the foundation of of politics, not the individual. And he says that there are a number of characters. So the first of all is that when you're in a community, it limits the choices that you have, um, mm -hmm. who your friends are going to be, what your career is going to be, um, who you're going to marry, what you can do and not do. Your your choices are limited. Mm -hmm. So if you want to emphasize personal choice and throw off the shackles of a, of a tightly knit community that tells you how to do and what to live your life, where that, that again, um, as we're talking about on a local level, that political impulse of how to order society is imposed socially. If you want to throw that off, um, you know, you can, yeah, you can claim personal choice. Um, 
that's one thing. But then what happens is, is you, you begin to get social breakdown. He says, the other thing too, as well is, is privacy. He says in a well-functioning community, people are in your business all the time. Everybody knows what's going on in your life. And then the other thing is that in a small community, there's a clear sense of authority and it may not be spoken, but somebody is in charge and deciding what the rules are. Um, and then there is in a, a well-functioning community, an active definition of sin and evil. In other words, people understand what is right and what is wrong. And then through these mechanisms of, of social cohesion, what is right and what is wrong is enforced. And what Aaron Holt argues is that if you break all of this down, to have a functioning society, you still need all of these same functions. And if they're not there in a vibrant manner in the community, what ends up happening is that the state is forced mm -hmm. to take mm -hmm. on those roles. Exactly. So the state then begins to limit your choices. The state begins to invade your privacy. The state begins to exercise authority over your life. And it defines what sin is. And this is what we're seeing now in the modern managerial state. Yep. Um, and so if if you're rebelling against the managerial state, those functions still have to have to exist somewhere. And the only way to devolve them from the state is to reintegrate them into the community again. Yeah, this is important. I, I wrote about this in. Um, uh, what, so in, um, in an essay called The Triumph of the Political, which was published in Paul Gottfried's um, recent anthology. And I talked about the. There's like this um there's this uneasy relationship in the 90s between the libertarians and the paleo conservatives, the old fashioned conservatives, because both of them were against the managerial state, but for completely mm -hmm. different reasons. The libertarians, because it was encroaching on their individual rights um to do whatever they wanted, basically, uh, you know, within their own bounds. And not all libertarians are created equal, but generally <laughs> speaking, that was the libertarian case against the managerial state. The paleoconservative case against the managerial state was that the managerial state in the 20th century was replacing the deep roots of a social society. The state was uh, creating an artificial um, foundation for what a priesthood. Be, yeah. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's the way to interpret it, you know, as, as a Christian is is they were secularizing a lot of these Christian themes. But this is something that you get a lot of from um, Robert Nisbet, the great you know, sociologist, paleoconservative sociologist, as he talks about just this the great transformation in the West was from this organic network of hierarchical and authoritative bonds between a people over time, the replacement of that with the artificial machine, this machine that was generated by state power using the momentum of the managerial revolution in the early 20th century. And just that it swapped out the older ways of life for the state driven um, social structure. Um, and so, yeah, what you're talking about, I think is, is dead on. And that's what happens when you lose the community ties, when they're unraveled, when they're severed, you get a totalitarian state. And what was the and what was the holiness that this priesthood was was ushering the people towards? And it was you know you can say maximizing GDP, uh, uh, whatever efficiency and productivity. Yeah, and the the idea that um, that this this new priesthood which was wholly unqualified to determine what sin is, would have the, the authority to uh, over the people to minister that. And, and we see it everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I was going to ask you, CJ, uh, what, do, what do you see as the modern, do you see the conflation in this, in this modern managerial state, this neoliberal thing, uh, a conflation of sin and crime and a confusion of those two things, because I, that's one thing I think the two kingdom approach speaks. So uh, not radical two kingdom, but just the traditional two kingdom approach speaks so well to is an real, a true understanding of the difference between sin and, and crime. Um, yeah, I, th I, I do think this is one of the things about um, when you, when you have a materialist revolution, there is no sin in the sense that you're uh, you are breaching some transcendent law. There's no God that you can offend. 
And so crimes are sins in that sense, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Uh, and, and that's, that's sort of what happens when you, you take the Christian roots of our society and you sort of bastardize them and you turn them into these weapons of, you know, material pursuit, like, like uh, along a new metaphysic. This is another consequence of Christians not participating in the political order is you have the secularization of Christianity. That's sort of what has organically happened. But mm -hmm. I do think that the two kingdoms view can understand this in a healthy way, that the point of political action is not to make us righteous before God. There is a God and nothing the state can do can, can, um, you know, interact with those, with that direct relationship between us and the transcendent but what it can do is it can recognize which things um are threats to the political integrity the political you know stability of a society um and it just so happens that because it's the same god that's the head of both of these kingdoms the there's a there's a lot of overlap there's a lot of continuity between things that are considered sin and things that should be considered crime the continuity is because god ordered the cosmos and there is a reflection there there's a mirror between heaven and earth in that way and so there's a lot of overlap between sin and crime and the sin of the people becomes you know a sort of a criminal conspiracy to undermine the political stability and continuity over time yes and that's a that's an excellent point cj and then you know, there, there's, there are, as you say, there are two means by which that that order can be established. One is, you know, when you look at it, say from the from the perspective of the church, it comes through um, personal salvation, a change in your spiritual condition, and then discipleship into a Christian way of living, which leads to. Um, a, the self-control that allows you to be a self-governing moral person. The other would be then, um, and that's in a sense, the role that the church takes on, you know, teaching discipleship. But then the other role would be then that of, of the state, which when chaos erupts in society because of those who cannot manage themselves and cannot live uprightly and then threaten the body, body politic um, are dealt with, by means of the the sword, and that this in a sinful world is also has to be seen as a form of grace. This kind of restrained violence that the state has to restrain this kind of disorder is a good, a net good for society. When people cannot um, restrain themselves morally and then threaten the body politic, that is a it is a, a grace from God that we have an entity, the magistrate who has been instructed by God to, to deal with that, um, hopefully without violence, but if necessary, with violence. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And that's, I think that's the function of the state, um, you know, especially in a post-lapsarian world. And, and the cool thing is the way that God has ordered things is the state, the state can be, you know, fully cognizant only of its own interests you know, it, it can pursue stability for its own sake, for the sake of keeping power. That in itself is also a grace. It doesn't need um, to have this like, um, you know, there, it, it's helpful if it if it does have this heaven orientedness. But there's something about, you know, the state, you know, the, the people in the state. The state is not this um, anti-personal thing. It's actually just people. But when people act to protect their own power and prevent enemies from taking them over, um, you know, it, it does work in the same way. And this is what's so sinister about our own political system right now is, is that the, the political leadership is so, um, it's so dysfunctional. It, it, it ignores the longevity of its own, you know, um, political prowess. It has no interest in, you know, this is one of the downsides of, of democracy, by the way, is that everything is so short term. They're not looking generations down the road. They're only looking about their own, you know, th they only have power for a limited time. They only high have time power preference. For years. You know, so they have a very high time preference. And this is when it's this is what's so sinister about the managerial state right now is that everything has to be like you have to loot the treasury before you lose access. You know, that's that's exactly the mentality of these people. And so all the incentives um, are for immorality, they're for short term gain. They're for, uh, you know, they're for, you know, material, you know, abundance and opportunism. They're for, um, you know, pleasing the people, giving them whatever they want in terms of like their moral sanctions. And so it's just everything is just building on top of each other. And that's why 
know, this things are so so bad and they look so ugly is because the political elite have just completely um, distanced themselves from anything, you know, anything higher than their own personal immediate short term interest. You're sounding like Hoppe. <laughs> that, that's my background. <laughs> so yeah. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, it no, is. I, it's huge, hugely influential. Yeah. For, for me, I was reading. Shoot, I was reading his stuff back when he was just writing articles before he really started publishing his books. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's my uh, back. I, I was, I, I spent a lot of years in the in the, with the Mises Institute. I, was, I have I had good friends there. I wrote there. I worked. You know, I did some things for them. So yeah, that's my background. <laughs> you know, Hoppe was one of those guys that really embodied. He and and Gary North both, I think, embodied the pre anarcho capitalist takeover of that school of thought. Um, there were a lot of paleo assumptions undergirding that particular strain of libertarianism. Uh, I, I hasten, I don't, I, I, I don't even like calling what they uh, talked about libertarianism only because what libertarianism has now become, which is basically uh, let's all be like Mogadishu. Um, it just seems it, it seems odd to me, uh, but I didn't know that was your background. That's interesting. We got that in common then. Uh, yeah. What What's also interesting is in in what you're saying in terms about the the short term focus, CJ, is when you tie it into something that Lule notes in his book on propaganda that propaganda for it to, for it to work must be aligned with the cultural sort of spirit of the people in that regard. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that sort of in the post Rousseau world is that we have embraced this idea, essentially that people are good, that they're blank slates <laughs> and that the problems that we face are out there outside of us in society. And that if we can merely engineer the, 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 the outside material realities, then everything within us will our life our own personal life will be fine and so you begin this whole process of 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 managing um towards of trying to solve all of the problems of society one by one you know iteratively trying to manage it towards this this utopian idea but what it excludes and Alul notes this and this is why in many ways conservatism struggles because our society tells us that we can solve all of the problems. The managerial um, technical system says that we can solve all of our problems without any personal cost to ourselves so that mm -hmm. we can have and do anything we want. We can indulge ourselves as we wish. And as long as the state exists, the technical regime exists to engineer society, all of these problems that we face can be eliminated. And so if when we come along and say that no, that the foundation of society really begins with your own personal moral restraint. We are working at cross purposes to the larger fundamental social reality that has, that liberalism has, um, you know, sort of the grant. If we talk about the, the organizing idea around which that, that motivates our society today, it's this drive for human progress. And so what we basically say is that no, you aren't going to be able to solve, the state cannot solve all of these problems through the managerial technical system that you have to exercise personal moral restraint at, you know, in, in a, in a integrated social context, we're giving a message that basically runs contrary to the foundational messages now messaging now that it's in our society. Yeah, no, I, yes. I, I completely agree. I think the entire structure the ethical structure of modern society is do as you will and if anyone gets in the way of that they're an evil person and therefore you know the state itself mm -hmm. under this thinking has been getting in the way of people and, 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 and if it ever acts in a way that doesn't facilitate your ability to set yourself free or discover yourself or live your best life now if the state ever gets in the way of that it's an evil state. And that's what the, that's the definition of tyranny for them is anything that gets in the way of my pursuit of pleasure. Um, you know, anything that restrains those passions. And, and yeah, this is why we're eating ourselves alive is because we have this mentality that says, 
Um, I have to be free to do what I want. And if I'm not free, that's, that's where the homosexual and transsexual, you know, phase comes in. If someone even says that I, if I can't be the sex that I want, that's fascism. You know, they're getting in the way because I've been promised this. I've been promised that the entire point of Western society is for me as an individual to fulfill my own um, standards of the good life. That's that's the that's the definition of freedom for them. Um, it's the popular result, sovereignty on meth. Yeah, <laughs> and literally on meth. And, and that's and that's that's the entire. And so what you see across society is that the more people absorb this mentality and the more they discover that there are um, there are restraints, there are restrictions. You can't actually live that life. You find yourself in a world of despair where psychiatric drugs are uses at all time high therapy is a blooming industry because people are not satisfied that is not the way to a good life and we're we're having to discover that the hard way the well, those are the new priests yeah but there, there's in also addition in, to the state sorry there's, sorry Kryptos. Oh, there's, there's also kind of internal contradiction because as you say that this is the the the, do, the doctrine cj that you know my per, my exercise of my own personal choice and sovereignty is sacrosanct but the, the 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 problem runs in is is then if you pass almost moral responsibility off onto the state to to sort of manage society and fix all of the problems, that what happens is as you've broken down the community that used to smother you and 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 impose its morality on you, is that what happens when my exercise of personal sovereignty infringes on your exercise of personal sovereignty and somebody has to adjudicate between the two. So eventually what happens is that the state begins to get called in increasingly to manage your freedom, your sacrosanct personal choice. So in other words, in order to make your sac sacrosanct personal choice to instantiate that requires a near totalitarian system. So the struggle that we have as as Christians, so people still believe that their their own personal sovereignty is sacrosanct. The state is then becoming increasingly totalitarian to manage that personal freedom, and it's it's also it's 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 fallout. Mm -hmm. But for us then to say that in the short term, it's a good for us as Christians to enter into the political to counter this notion to establish constraint, to establish that certain things have to be sacrificed for the long-term goal. All of these basic political realities that you recognize, you then become, and this, I think, the thing that people say, you become, an, the, the Christian who desires political activity becomes an enemy of personal liberty. And I think that's how a lot of people, they're, they instinctively approach this, that the Christian exactly. who desires the political for the good of society to say that no we have to run we have to counter these these myths of of personal liberty um and say that we have to exercise restraint that we can't have it all um that then inherently i think people react negatively because they have been fed this belief correct that that my own personal choice is sacrosanct above all else exactly that's right this is why when i talk about individual liberty i call it hegemonic liberty because the history the, the history of the west is, is about liberty within the confines of our own heritage way of life and you know social dynamics it's not this absolutist liberty that came out of the french revolution that has no part of our you know anglo heritage really i mean the idea of liberty is downstream from um from the community from from the restraints that 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 community has recognized over a thousand years and i think un you know severing that relationship between liberty and community or liberty and heritage or liberty and morality has done completely damaging things to our liberty Will yeah you... which is which just yeah exactly which is and a lot of it and i i wrote about this recently is that um a lot of it has come as the result of industrialization and this was something that peter laslett noted that with the coming of industrialization, you have the breakdown of these household units um, as as industry did things more efficiently than things could be done in the household means of production. Um, the family was broken down. People go into the industrial and then the state was required to step in and pick up the social functions that the household um, was 
um, used to occupy and used to do. So the community used to do all of these functions. And then once they were broken down through industrialization, um, the state was forced to do it. So in many ways, people look at, well, you know, the free market is good. Socialism is bad. But the, the quote unquote, the, the market, industrial market economy that we have requires um, state involvement to make it work, to, to do the things that individual companies can't do, to build roads, infrastructure, power. And but then also to take up the roles of the family that were broken down as we industrialize society. So there's a whole range of things that are downstream from the 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 material the consumer society the material prosperity that we enjoy, and the quote unquote personal freedom that we enjoy, um, and people are not seeing in a sense that uh, sooner or later that we're you know once the golden period is done and all of the the benefits the memory of a functioning society are gone, eventually you require a totalitarian state to manage civic order, or you have just the complete breakdown of everything. And that's kind of, I think, where we're at now. And then, so we as Christians enter into this goal and say, well, we've got to establish some sort of sanity to this. Um, we're looked upon instinctually as um, uh, yeah. tyrants. Yeah. Well, the destruction of the category of, of evil is, it seems paramount because let, let's, let's just make it, very simple uh, 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 in summary uh, when the state was instituted or at least as the Bible, the biblical narrative uh, institutes it, uh, the role of the state is to is to punish murder. it's to shed shed to be that which sheds blood. We see in Romans uh, 13 that the the idea is to is to bear the sword against evil. It's Injustice. the role of the of the Christian. Yeah, it's the role of the uh, of the Christians to inform what that evil is. And therefore, if we just remove that category of evil, what we've done is we've 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 uh, castrated the bull. Um, and there is and and that's why uh, from a materialist standpoint, the the state. It, that's the war the state is fighting. I, I I don't say the state as a as a platonic thing. I mean the current manifestation. Mm -hmm. That's the war they're fighting. The evil does not exist. Therefore, you have nothing to say. You have nothing to say. This category doesn't exist. You invented it to for whatever reasons thousands of years ago, and we say no more. Uh, and. Therefore, anything goes. Uh, I think Haywood, Charles Haywood, our friend, uh, is uh, you know he's Eastern Orthodox, but I think he's 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 pretty good on on understanding how the mo the modern application of uh, of this is. Apart from how you know all the categories that we study as as Reform people. Yeah, I think maybe we just. I think at that point would probably a good point to maybe draw this to a close. We've been now for just over an hour going on and um, there's a lot that could be said or whatever too, but um, is there anything that you would like to say in closing CJ? Well, let me just answer the question. Why is it important for Christians to be political? I think, I think what Christians contribute to the political is um, it, th there's a sense of uh, <clears throat> the limits of man that it brings forth to the table that man is um, a creature that is not angelic he is a creature capable of great harm uh, in society when unleashed from any restraints and i think christians more than any other people have a have a have a, um, a grasp of the world historical dynamic and the transcendent nature of um, human relations right because ultimately we are a reflection of, of more you know cosmic conflict um, and we bring forth that to the political. I think I think that's why Christians need to be involved. Is we we have a certain metaphysic in mind that draws upon the limits of man, the evilness of man, and the fact that men are capable of good things, but only if we're chastised, only if we s submit ourselves as a people to the ordering that God has made for him for for mankind. And I think that's I think that's my final thoughts. Is, is Christians they don't need to represent you know, the gospel doesn't need to be spread by the sword. And that's not the point. 
the point of Christians involved in pol politics is to remind people that metaphysics does matter. And if you have a materialist metaphysic, if you have a, you know, a even a metaphysic that um, you know puts up some other god as as their ultimate, because they're, ultimately everyone does have some sort of god, some sort of ultimate standard, right? Christians have on their side a metaphysic that reflects um, the reality of the cosmos, and the fact that we have lost that reality is um, a cause of our of our demise and our degradation. That's a really good spot to end. Um, thank you both, CJ, Ron, for, for joining me and for hopefully helping the, the audience that we have um, to, to walk through this. I think it's an important subject, especially these days, um, for us to be meditating on. And hopefully as it gets posted, maybe there'll be some questions back and we can have a chance to, to answer some of those questions at another date and, and continue the discussion. Again, have a good day, gentlemen. And um, with that, I bid you farewell. Thank you.